you would open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 2. It's good to see you all out here this evening. Continue to work through Exodus. And we'll do the first 10 verses tonight. Because the next step is a great many more verses than that. Starting in Exodus chapter 2 and verse 1. Now a man from the house of Levi went and took as his wife a Levite woman. The woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a fine child, she hid him three months. When she could hide him no longer, she took and made a basket. And took for him. She took for him a basket made of bulrushes and daubed it with bitumen and pitch. She put the child in it and placed it among the reeds by the river bank. And his sister stood at a distance to know what would be done with him. Now the daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river while her young women walked beside the river. She saw the basket among the reeds and sent her servant woman and she took it. She opened it and saw the child and behold the baby was crying. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. Then the sister then his sister said to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call a nurse from the Hebrew women to nurse the child for you? Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. So the child went and called the child's mother. So the girl went and called the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child away and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. So the woman took the child and nursed him. When the child grew older, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter, and he became her son. She named him Moses because, she said, I drew him out of the water. Moses gets put into the water. So let's look at the story. Let's break it down and see what happens inside. And we'll start with the people of the story. First are Moses' parents. His dad's not even mentioned. His mom is mentioned a couple of times, but she's not even called by name. Neither is his sister. Neither is the princess. In Numbers chapter 26, verse 59, the chronology, we see that the father of Moses is Amram. His wife is Jochebed, or Jochebed the daughter of Levi, who was born to Levi in Egypt. She bore to Amram, Aaron, Moses, and Miriam, their sister. So here we see their names. Jochebed is not named very often in Scripture, but if you have gone through and studied women of faith and righteous women, Jochebed's going to be toward the top of that list. So along with other godly women that you would list, Remember Moses' mother, Jochebed. It says here in this verse that she is the daughter of Levi. We should take this to understand that she is a Levite, or she is of the tribe of Levi. Levi would be over 350 years old if he were her father. And if Levi were the father of Jochebed, as in father to daughter immediate relationship, she would have about 3,600 brothers and sisters because that's how many people, uh, at least in the chronologies, can be counted toward this time. So she is a descendant of Levi and establishes Moses' Levitical line and Aaron as being part of the Levitical line. Moses is named by Jochebed, by Pharaoh, uh, not named by Jochebed, but is named by Pharaoh's daughter. It is most presumed that this is the queen or to be queen Hatshepsut uh, from the Egyptian dynasty. If you're into that, I know a couple of you are. That's a really cool thing. Hatshepsut was a fairly prominent uh, queen in Egypt, and you can look around the chronology for that to see who she is. We'll talk a little bit more about Moses and the princess later. Moses has other family that are named. He has a brother who is three years older than him named Aaron, and he has a sister who is probably the oldest. We get that she is probably the oldest because while he is three months old, she stands at a distance. So she's standing. She's 
walk at one, talk at two, she's probably more than one. She's able to talk, she's probably more than two. She's not a um, twin of Aaron, so she's probably older than Aaron since Aaron is three years old. She's able to stand, she's able to observe and then report back that is what she is doing at the riverbank as is placed by her mother. So we look and see that they are of the tribe of Levi. Mom's name is Jochebed or Jochebed. Dad's name is Amram. And we have the sister Miriam, then Aaron and Moses. She puts him into the water. She has to put him into the water. The king said so. But she puts him into the water in a thing. Have you heard the baby Moses song? I debated on whether to sing it or not, and as bad off-key as I was this morning, I've decided not. Baby Moses in a basket, on the water, on the water. Pharaoh's daughter found him, gave him, lo gave him love and taught him. He led Israel to their freedom, to the tune of Frere Jaca. In Exodus chapter 2, in verse 3 and verse 5, if you have your new King James or your old King James, you'll notice that what she puts him in is an ark. This word is used 28 times in Scripture. It's used on two different occasions. There are two men that are known for their ark. Noah is the first one. It's used 26 times of him. Moses is the only other one. It's used twice of him and in these two verses. This is important only in that this is, seems to be the only reason this word exists. And we talked a little bit about this word whenever we went through and, and talked about Noah as well. But the word is teva, T-E-B-A-H. And it, there is no other word that means anything like this in the Hebrew language. It's a special word. It kind of means box. Now this would be a box made out of reeds, but... It also means uh, there's Egyptian an Egyptian word that's a lot like this word, and it means coffin. So that's an interesting fact as well. Moses' mother places him in this coffin, in this box, or in this basket, depending on however you would like to put it, and she places him in the water. She knew the risk. The king said all of the baby boys have to die. And when the, when the uh, midwives refuse to post birth abort the children, he commands everyone, gives an open general order. If you see a Hebrew baby, throw it in the river. It belongs in the river. Send it to the river. No mama's going to do that. She builds a basket, a box, an ark. She places her son in this and puts him into the river. The word that I have is places. She placed it among the reeds. Well, there again, what mama's going to chuck the baby into the water? But I think that this word means much more than just she was gentle as she laid the basket or the box into the water. I think she knew exactly what she was doing. She placed it in the reeds on the riverbank, and then she had Miriam stand by and watch to see what would happen to the baby. Why? Because it was the time of day, or it was the time of, a uh, period of time where princess, the princess, would be down to bathe. So Miriam stands guard to see what happens. We'll stop right here real quick. Mom, I've done what the king commanded me to. It's no longer safe for the rest of my family and I'm going to, I've got a beautiful baby. It said it was a fine boy. He's a fine baby. Beautiful in some translations earlier in the, in the chapter. I'm going to give it the best case scenario. We'll see what God has in store. And I will follow the command and try to protect my family as best as possible. The princess finds him and takes pity. Now the next part of the story is uncomfortable. It's uncomfortable because of the racial slurring that's in it. She took pity on him and said, this is one of the Hebrews' children. 
This is a derogatory term. This is a slang term or a near slang term for the people from beyond the river. Remember, Abraham has come from beyond the Euphrates River over in the Chaldees, and he has come all the way over here. They don't look like the Egyptians. So she sees that this is one of the Hebrews' children. Now Miriam is smart. She plays this to her advantage. You don't want to raise that Hebrew baby. Let me go get a Hebrew mama to take care of that Hebrew baby for you. All the time using the same language that will make this princess uncomfortable with holding the child because of her racism, because of her patriotic pride to her family. So Miriam goes and gets Jochebed. Who better to take care of the baby than the baby's actual mother? Now, I'm sure that there's probably a lot of mothers, a lot of weeping mothers throughout the children of Israel. But Miriam is in place to go get the mama of the baby. The princess says to take care of him until he is weaned. Take this child away, verse 9, and nurse him for me, and I will give you your wages. Now, typically weaning in this community would be a two- to three-year-old child. But what we're assuming in this term of weaning is that she's only talking about breastfeeding, and when the child no longer breastfeeds, that that would be the end of the weaning period. So the weaning period doesn't necessarily have to be just the feeding. It's not a great source. But in Peter Pan, the big problem at the beginning of the story is that it's Wendy's last night where? In the nursery. And she's obviously not. Uh, she's obviously able to feed herself at that point. And there are some that would consider that this age limit to be peripubescent, that he is, he's entering into puberty. And the, for evidence, they would point to verse 10, when the child grew older, meaning when he started to develop and start to look a little bit more like a man or had a growth spurt or, or some other uh, pubescent style growth, that this is the nursemaid period that mama gets to hold on to him. Now whether it's only two or three years, or whether he gets to stay with his mother up to 12, you know, you had, I, I have to believe that Jochebed would keep going back and saying, you don't want him yet. You don't want him yet. I have to turn him over to you at some point, but I want to keep him as long as possible. He's my baby. And so eventually she has to turn him over to the princess, and the princess names him. When the child grew older, verse 10, she brought him to Pharaoh's daughter and he became her son. She named Moses because she said, I drew him out of the water. Okay, well she named him, I drew him out of the water, which is Moses. The problem with this is that Moses is a Hebrew name. That's why she didn't want to keep him at the beginning, because he's a Hebrew. Not only that, but she is the princess, meaning she is royalty. But it's more than that. This is the culture of Egypt. She's not just royalty. She's deity. She is a god. And you wouldn't name your child a slave name if you're a god. Moses is properly spoken in the Hebrew Moshe, M O S. H E H Moshe Moses is the one who writes this and uses the words particularly some have used that to speculate that he is only going to be known by his Hebrew name later on and in the future he will refuse to be called Pharaoh's uh, the son of Pharaoh or the son of Pharaoh's daughter but at this time she names him well, if he's going to be a child of a god, and eventually be a god himself, he's going to need a god name. Moses may have had a much longer Egyptian name, such as Hapmos or Eremos, both meaning one born of the Nile. Well, that makes sense. Drew him out of the water. 
is what Pharaoh's daughter called him, the Nile itself being a god in their culture. This would give him a god name. This would fulfill what Scripture says about him being drawn out of water. It would be an Egyptian name. It also makes sense as to why later Moses refuses to be called Pharaoh's son. So we see, and we'll talk about it possibly more when we get there, when he refuses to be called Pharaoh's son, he is refusing to be called deity later on in, in his life. <laughs> He's drawn out of the water. When he's put into the water, he's dead. That's what his mama thinks. She's going to give him the best possible scenario, but she's leaving her child in the river. There's crocodiles in that river. There are Egyptians that walk up and down the river, and as I speculated before, I think she's putting him right into the path of the Egyptians to hope and plead for their mercy, maybe from a soft-hearted princess. After all, aren't they the ones who talk to animals and clean houses with songs? She's trying her best, but that boy's dead. All the other, many of the other Hebrews' children, they're dead. They've been destroyed by the orders of the king. So she puts him into the water. He's dead, or at least he's as good as dead. But when the daughter of Pharaoh draws him up out of the water, he becomes royalty. The son of Pharaoh's daughter. Not only does he become royalty, in their eyes he becomes deity. Look, that's a very veiled and convoluted style, a very poetic feel toward baptism. But that's the way it works for us, is it not? If you haven't been baptized, you're dead in your sins. You got nothing. You will be destroyed. Go into the water. Dead. As good as dead. Come up out of the water. Part of the family of God. Royalty. Deity. A child of the one true king. We see this language from the beginning. We saw it with Noah. As he was... Uh, 1 Peter 3, 18-21 It talks about him passing through the waters in his ark, in his coffin saved by God and that our baptism is kind of like that Moses has a similar experience he's going to go on to deliver the Israelites from bondage he's going to go on to mediate between the children of Israel and God and he's going to go on to stand between God and the children of Israel with their sin and say don't destroy them destroy me first to shield them and he doesn't do any of that until he's drawn up out of the water. Don't misunderstand. I'm not saying we should baptize babies. That's not how things work. I'm pointing out that God uses similar aspects throughout His Word. There are deep ties that will come back to Moses being in the river. But here are the base things. By faith, His mama put Him in the water. And because of her faith, he was drawn up out of the water to lead the children of Israel delivered by God. That's what we're called on to do as well. By faith, enter the water to be raised up and drawn out and used by God. Not a super long message. That's the whole thing for this evening. First ten verses. The next section, eat a big lunch. <laughs> But to make it easier, here were the first ten. If you haven't been baptized, this is what God calls us to do. Go in dead, be something different when you come up. And to live a better life. Masterfully, our song leader has chosen free waters as our invitation song. Well done, sir. If you need to fix anything, whether it's to go into the water and come up new, fresh, royalty, deity, a child of the one true king, or if you need to clear anything, clarify anything between yourself and the king, make it known as we stand and sing.